as we're continuing to look at and study this, this great sermon of inauguration of the kingdom of God, the great sermon of our great king, we've, we've noticed several things. He started off by explaining what traits will be evident and present in those who are his. And that is in contrast to, tho to those who have other goals in life, who have other agendas. And he explained that there are two kingdoms that are warring with each other. And there is one kingdom that thankfully will end up being victorious, and that is the kingdom of the creator of heavens, of the heavens and the earth. The one who gets to be our God and, and, um, and in whom we become sons and daughters and citizens of his kingdom and receive every blessing, spiritual and natural and eternal life and all of the wonderful things that are promised there. But then there is another path to take, and that would be the path of self, which is actually enslaved to sin. And sadly, it ends up in a realization of a curse. But the Lord wants us to be blessed. And that's what we need to remember here, is the Lord is showing us how to be blessed, but he's also exposing those who are pretending to be among the blessed, but are actually on the wrong path. And so, at the, at, at the close of chapter 5, what we saw was, uh, we, we saw six examples of how people's hearts are wrong toward the law of God. And so Jesus is lifting the law back up to the place where it should have been all along, the place where we are dependent upon him in order uh, to lead a life that honors him and pleases him. That's where it belonged. And now as, as we move into chapter 6, he gives, uh, he gives a focus, especially these first 18 verses. Verses 1 through 18, he gives a focus on uh, the, the practice of righteousness, if you will, and specifically in those religious practices. And here's what I mean. So in these 18 verses, what he deals with specifically are examples of how those who are pretenders, pretenders to, uh, to be among the blessed, here's how they are carrying out their faith, how they are living out their faith specifically in the areas of giving to those in need. They look at those in need, how they look at those around them uh, to whom they can be a blessing. Secondly, how they pray. To whom are they praying? For what purpose are they praying? And thirdly, how they are uh, crucifying the flesh, how they are putting down uh, the the carnal desires, how they are disciplining themselves after the Lord, specifically in the practice of fasting, which many of us may be familiar with. It's the, uh, it's the abstaining from eating or drinking, uh, you know, re removing those certain things from you in order to have a, a greater spiritual focus, in order to make sure that God is being glorified all the more in your life. And so these three practices Jesus makes illustrations of as to how we are to practice our religion, okay? And I'm saying religion in the, in the strict sense of the word, because I know we, we always make note that, uh, that living the Christian life as a New Testament believer in the joy of the Lord, is, it's not religion, it's relationship. But in that phrase, what we are uh, making a contrast of is, you know, a, a series of you know, actions and do's and don'ts reduced to, uh, you know, just a, the natural content and relationship, which is um, how God interacts with us and how we are viewed by the Lord. And knowing that in that relationship, there's that joy because we are connected to the source of life. We are connected to the source of joy and of blessing. Whereas with religion, it's just that dry, uh, you know, practices of do's and don'ts and uh, just a list of commands which, which end up just frustrating you, beating you down, and making you feel as though you will never be able to achieve anything. That's what dead, dry religion or pretend religion 
will do to you. And here's what Jesus is explaining, and he's especially making an example of those who should have known him best in the ways that they are uh, practicing uh, the, the outworkings of their religion, they are actually evidencing how far from God that they are. But the Lord has brought us close. And there is a way where when we act out of that place of being close to the Lord, where blessing comes, where blessing can remain upon us, and then also where He can reward us for acting appropriately, for living in a righteous way. And, you know, one verse that I was sharing with, with my daughter uh, last night because she was asking about the, the love of God and, and why do we need to pray? And, uh, and I thought it was a perfect question because that's just what I've been preparing. <laughs> so I said, okay, she's seven. She's seven. All right, how do I put this? And, and one, one of the things I explained to her is that, we, is that we pray so that we can glorify the Lord so that we can remember uh, to whom we, are, uh, whom we are living for and that we can see just how good he is as we connect with him, as we uh, remain in his presence and we seek to do his will and remind ourselves that we are living for him who has rescued us from an all but certain final destination. That brings a much different approach to prayer, right? Rather than what some are, are um, you know, mistakenly believing. That prayer is, you know, you, 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 uh, you give the prayer and the Lord has to, has to answer it. He told us in his word, everything that your heart desires, I'll give you. And they'll try to use you know, verses like that in order to turn even prayer the ultimate expression of glorifying the Lord and, and uh, remembering our dependence upon Him, they'll turn it into a self-fulfilling um, activity or mode of action. And that's why Jesus is so uh, focused on pointing these things out because He wants His kingdom to be different than any other kingdom in the earth. And so as we get into this chapter, at the very beginning of chapter 6, uh, here's what Jesus says. Let's read the first verse. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. I'll stop right there. So in this first verse, Jesus is laying out the theme for the next chapter the next um, collection of teachings and the next three illustrations. What he's saying here is, as you are practicing your righteousness, which always has a, a component of an outworking of what has happened in the heart. Just like later today, we'll be celebrating new members of God's family, welcoming them in and seeing them go under the water and leaving their old life behind arising to be that new creation with a brand new life um, in, in uh, you know, having uh, God's righteousness imputed to them and, and being made new from the inside out to him. We see that wonderful expression there, and then the expectation will be going forward that you will live out that righteousness. Because once you, once you declare your trust in the Lord, your faith and hope in the Creator, from then on, the way that you live your life certainly matters to Him. And at the end of our lives, when we're welcomed into heaven, if we lead a faithful life, we will have rewards, heavenly rewards that will be waiting for us when we cross over from this to that world, when we go and see the, the unfiltered uh, presence of God. He will be able to welcome us in and then show us, here are your rewards that you have collected over those uh, years of serving me. No matter how short or how long you've been uh, serving the Lord, you'll have a collection of those things. But then there are those actions, those thoughts, desires, all those things that you've held on to or made typical in your life. They'll either be part of your heavenly reward treasure chest or they will be burned up upon entering. Or for the hypocrite who lives 
that way, you will come to the end of your life and find the ultimate tragic surprise. Depart from me, I never knew you. It's a very serious thing that Jesus is warning against here. There are no pretenders in the kingdom. You're either saved or you're not. You're either blessed or you're cursed. I want to be the blessed. And so what is the theme that Jesus is getting at here? He's he's saying, if you practice your righteousness to be noticed by others, because our, our religion, the relationship that we have with the Lord is meant to be lived out in our lives, both in our homes, in, in, our, in our bedroom, uh, when we're, whenever we're you know, going to the bank, when we go to the store, when we visit others, when we walk around, drive around, whatever it is, we're, we are practicing that which we proclaim to believe. And so eventually, someone else is going to witness how we are living, how we are speaking, how we are acting. And Jesus is saying, the reason you do it matters. It speaks to the motivation, and it could ultimately reveal for whom you are actually living. So here's the principle here. If we practice our religion for others, we will not please God. We can put it this way that seeking the praise and admiration of others will not lead to heavenly rewards. And the way that Scripture makes a contrast of these rewards is that heavenly rewards are incorruptible. They will not fade away. They will always be there for you. The Lord will always be celebrating the fact that you lived that righteous life for him and that he was able uh, to, to see your rescuing from the clutches of the evil one who wants to destroy you and everyone that you love. So seeking the praise and admiration of others will not lead to the heavenly rewards. Instead, they will lead to maybe compliments. Now, they will lead to others looking up to you as a model or as an example. You may be able to gain influence even in your society. You may be elected to public office and wield that kind of power because people are you know, thinking of how, how great you are, how committed you are, how religious you might be, how devoted you are, how long you pray, how much you give, uh, how intensely you fast, you know, depriving yourself, you know, uh, just you know, withering away. It's all for the Lord. But if it's motivated by others, at the end of your life, you will not find the rewards that you hoped to find. Instead, the compliments and the adoration of those around you will be your reward. And as soon as those compliments are uttered, they're gone. You may remember that they said that, but that's about as long as they'll last. And then if your mind goes, you don't even have the memory of the rewards. (laughs) So they'll go even faster. (laughs) so as i mentioned before the word righteousness here practicing your righteousness uh governs these three aspects of religious living and what i just mentioned the uh you know giving of alms right alms for the poor that would be helping in some way as, as you can uh you know those who are around you those in need especially there would be that uh then there would be the prayer And then there would be fasting. And uh, those have sometimes been referred to as the three pillars of Judaism. And especially the Jews in the first century AD would have known, would have been very much aware of this. They would have connected right away with the three points that Jesus was making. And so here's what it comes down to is that we must recognize the one to whom these good works or our righteousness is offered. We are doing it for the one who has saved us. We are doing it for the Lord. In Hebrews 4, verse 13, we read this. This is the Lord that we serve. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are uncovered and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we have an account to give. 
Every one of us will give an account for how we stewarded the life, the body, the mind, the um, resources that we have come into contact with. We will have to answer for that. And for the one who is seeking to be counted among the blessed, for the one who has dedicated their, their lives and their energies to his service, those are the ones that will find peace with God, will be welcomed in at the end of your life, and you will see his goodness forever and ever and ever. But what is the point here in Hebrews? Well, what the writer is explaining here is that there is nothing that you can hide from the Lord, which is why Jesus can make an accusation like this and have it be true, because when he's looking at the scribes and the Pharisees who devote 12 hours a day to copying uh, the Old Testament manuscripts, uh, to learning how to, how to be professional religious people, as I keep saying, as, as they are learning those things and immersed in that world, in that culture, in that uh, uh, series of practices and disciplines, he can see their hearts. So that's both scary that he can see our hearts at all times, but then also it should be a comfort because even though he sees our hearts on our worst days, he still chooses to rescue us. And he still chooses to love us and to call us his children. That's why a Christian is different. That's why the motivation of a Christian life is different. And in the last chapter, in uh, verse 16 of Matthew 5, Jesus said this, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works the outworking of, of your righteousness, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we're supposed to have good works. He, he wants to see us acting appropriately so that he can reward us. He wants us to be able to have a storehouse full of heavenly rewards that we can enjoy when we're in his presence after we've endured for this time of uh, in this world that's fallen full of struggle and pain and heartache and stress and anxiety and all of those things that seek to sap our spiritual fervor and strength. The Lord wants us to endure because that's only for a season. But after that comes perfect peace in eternal life in the presence of our creator. And in 1 Corinthians 3, we see an example of what these works are that will be blessed and will remain, and the works that are here for a moment and then gone. In 1 Corinthians verses 10 through 15, uh, Paul explains this, that we are to build on the foundation of Christ alone, and every man's works will be tested by holy fire. Now, many of you may be aware that one of the ways to craft something from a, a precious metal, gold or you know, anything like that, to get all the impurities out, to make it as valuable as possible, to make it as pure as possible, you have to heat it up. You have to heat it up to the point where it actually starts to turn into a liquid, and all the impurities can easily be separated from that, from that piece, from that hunk, you know, wh whatever it is. And the impurities can be sifted out, they can be removed, and then when it cools, it rehardens, and what you have is that pure, precious substance remaining. And so this is what every believer will go through. Here's what will be tested by holy fire. Here are the examples of types of things that Paul gives, is that the wood, the hay, and the straw works will be the ones that are worthless and burned up because as anyone knows, when you set fire to those things, the fire burns pretty well. But the works that are as the precious stones, those will remain. If you heat up a precious stone, it still remains that precious stone. The precious metal can be purified even further, but it doesn't stop being that precious metal. So that's the quality, right? We want to have works of quality, right? And, and the Christian understands how much they have been given by the Lord who was so gracious that as we were living a life that completely dishonored him, he still sought to rescue us 
We realize that, and now we see others who are in need of help, and we are eager to meet that need. Even if it's inconvenient, even if it puts us at a, a little bit behind the eight ball, if you will, we still desire to help in any way that we can. That's the approach of a Christian. And so here's, here's one thing to remember, is that the greatest reward that a believer can have is the knowledge that he has pleased the Lord. And I see the, the example in Revelation 4 of the elders who are around the throne of God, casting their crowns before him. Though we have uh, authority over many, though we have influence over a large number of people, over a, a district, over a region, great power among those who are uh, around us or underneath us in, in authority and submission, we cast our crowns before you, who is the king of all kings. And we raise up worship to you. So we'll get to the first, first il- illustration today. As I, as I mentioned before about the, uh, the almsgiving, here's what Jesus moves into. Uh, so let's read verses 2 through 4. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Very clear teaching and a very clear distinction made for the one who is seeking to serve God well, to please Him, to honor Him. Your motivation cannot be the attention and adoration of others. And this is a clear responsibility of all disciples because he he says it as if when you give, so it's a given, right? Oh, so to speak. No pun intended, I promise. <laughs> but we are, we are certainly, it's assumed that we will be doing this. So here, he's not, he's, he's not commanding it as if it's a brand new thing, but he's saying when you give, do it so that the other is blessed, but more so so that I am honored. If you're doing it for the attention of others, your motivation is wrong and you will not receive a thing. And the, the word here that's used to describe hypocrites, it's, it's a, a hypocrites, which referred especially to a, an actor in plays who goes on a stage and pretends to be someone else in front of everybody else. And a lot of times in the plays of, of that era, they would even put on masks, like large masks that would exaggerate uh, you know, has anyone ever seen the thing for the theater where it's the happy mask and the sad mask? So that is a device that was used at one time in the plays where you would put on the mask and they were interchangeable depending on, you know, the uh, dominant trait of the character that you were por- portraying. And so here's what a hypocrite does. They, they put on their mask and they do the things that they have learned, that they have decided or that they have seen, gains them influence with others. And that's how and why they carry it out. They put on the mask. Whether or not their heart is into it, they know what it will get them in the end. And that's why they do it. The praise and admiration of others. Which is ultimately for the praise and adoration of themselves. Because we tend to let ourselves off the hook with everything. We justify everything. We give ourselves a a free pass we're much more lenient on ourselves than we are on others. And certainly this is what a hypocrite will do because what they are engaging in is the act of pretending. And so that's to whom Jesus is referring. And so let's, let's fill in our first blank here. So when you are helping others, do not announce it. Because it's a given that we are to help others, when we do so, do not announce it.
But then in verse 3, Jesus says something interesting. He says, but when you're giving, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, this could be very difficult. I'm not exactly sure how you would physically do that, (laughs) or I guess mentally, right, as the case may be. How can you actually not know what one side of your body is doing? Well, certainly it's an expression, right? We don't want to, uh, you know, uh, whittle away all of those all of those ways of looking at the scripture. We have to look at it the way that it's presented to us, which is don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So if we're not announcing it before others, don't announce it, our next blank, to those around you. So if there's any way that you can keep it as private as possible, that is the best way to go about it. Jesus is not condemning anybody else knowing that you've done something good or something right or helped someone who was truly in need. That can be beneficial for others to to learn and see that example and, and you modeling that. So there's a place for that. But remember, God sees your heart. So he'll know. You're not going to get anything past him. But don't announce it to those around you and don't announce it to yourself. And there's a, um, there's a British pastor who put it this way. He said, when you're doing a good deed with regard to yourself, he said, don't take out your, your little book, your spiritual ledger, and then mark it down. You know, dear diary, on, <laughs> on September 13th, I gave $4,000. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and then put it back in your pocket, press it a little harder, close to your chest. <laughs> don't announce it to those around you and don't announce it to yourself. And we'll, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there for today. Hey, I'm Pastor Petey. And I'm Christina. Thanks for watching today. Let's stay connected. First, click the thumbs up on this video. Next, click subscribe. And lastly, click the Give Now link in the description to support the ministry so that we can continue reaching people all over the world. And if you're in the area, we'd like to personally invite you to join us right here in Middlefield, Connecticut and see for yourself what God is doing with our church family. Thanks again for watching.